satu uh, public lecture by uh, distinguished professor Professor Patnaik uh, from UMUC. I think we are very lucky and uh, privileged here because uh, we we are going to have a lecture from the first hand expert, uh, Professor, Professor uh, Patnaik. Uh, the seminar will be uh, convened by uh, Dr. Ari Yuliana and uh, for uh, hopefully we, we are going to have this seminar for about two, two hours and uh, we are really pleased to have all of you in the seminar. Professor, uh, Dr. Ari Yuliana, please. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the seminar entitled Prospect and Management Challenges in Improving Employee Quality Performance in the Digital Era by Professor Sandeep Patnai. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Ari Liana, the chairperson from uh, Business Administration Department faculty of law, social and political sciences, and I will be serving you as moderator today. Uh, before we discuss uh, later on, first of all, I would like to thank Prof. Sandeep and all the audiences uh, who joining this seminar, uh, uh, both in central office or head office of UT and regional centers, and we have several here, uh, regional centers from Aceh, Batam, Serang, it is West uh, Java, and then Surabaya, it is East Province of uh, Java. Yeah, I guess uh, four of the regional centers joining this uh, lecture. And I would like to share to, both, uh, to all of you a brief curriculum vitae of Prof. Sandeep Patnai, PhD, is as follows. Uh, Prof. Sandeep Patnai, PhD, is the professor and chair at the uh, marketing program at the University of Maryland University College or UMUC and then Dr. Pat Naik is an active researcher in the area of marketing communication and his recent research explores the synergistic relationship between traditional media uh, and the new social media and developing strategies as to how both could successfully be integrated into marketing campaign. And the third one is Prof. Professor Patnai has been teaching at UMUC since uh, 2008. He has taught a wide variety of graduate level courses in marketing and as well as organizational behavior. Prior to his joining UMUC or Uni uh, UMUC, as a faculty, Dr. Pat Naik was the research director at the Gallup and Robinson, right? And leading market research uh, firm affiliated to the Gallup organization. Dr. Pat Naik's current research focus has been on marketing strategy. And the, I want to share to you about uh, University of Maryland uh, University College a little bit. Uh, it is an American public, not-for-profit university, or we call it public state university, located in Adelphi in Prince George County, right? Yeah, Maryland, United States. Uh, UMUC offers classes and programs on campus in its academic centers in Largo and at satellite campuses uh, across the Baltimore-Washington metropolitan area throughout Maryland, as well as in Europe, uh, Middle East, and Asia. Asia. UMUC also uh, offering online courses for uh, several programs, so uh, everybody want to join <laughs> open courses from the UMUC, please welcome. Okay, I guess uh, that's the short uh, CV from Dr. Patnai. Uh, and now I would like to invite Prof. Sandeep to present the paper uh, about 60 minutes. Uh, so, Prof. Sandeep, please, time is yours. Thank you. Well, at the, at the outset, um, good morning and salam alaikum to all those present here and who are joining me online. It's an honor and a privilege 
for me and for my university that you have spared your valuable time and hosted us to share our thoughts about the digital world and its implications on the especially on a very important topic on HR and employee quality performance. There is no doubt that the world has become extremely connected and there is a, in the, in the past few years especially, in the past five or six years, the pace of change in the connectedness has increased dramatically. I would like to share um, um, a story which I believe I was uh, recently I, uh, I heard about from my colleague. So she had a three-year-old child and she went to her, uh, this was in the US, and they went to the grandparents' house. And the grandmother had an old television which had a smaller screen. So the th there was color, but oh, it was okay. not a, uh, you know, the smart TVs in which you have. And so these, this three-year-old goes up to, um, uh, the mom said, you know, like, this is a smaller TV, that's fine, it's grandma's TV. And she said, no, I can fix it. And so what he does is goes up to that small television and tries to stretch the string, uh, the screen with his fingers. <laughs> you know, just as you expand on an I iPhone or a, one of those you know, digital touch screen devices. The, it may sound, it, it, it looks very funny to us, but this is the digital generation. They cannot imagine a world where there was no internet. And to, to share another anecdote, Somebody, one of the professors had told his grandson, a grandchild, that she, when they were growing up, they did not have internet. So, and life was great. So she, this little girl was in preschool, and she goes and tells her uh, teacher, and she says, my grand, grand, grandpa was so poor that they did not have internet and possibly no electricity. <laughs> because the only time the modern generation, the younger generation, do not have a connection to the outer world is possibly when the battery in their smartphone runs out or where there is no electricity to power the Wi-Fi. The reason I'm telling you this is that the pace of change, the attitude, the technology, it's not just technology, it's the impact on the way we perceive the world has significantly transformed than anything we have seen in the recent past. In fact, the pace of change has been so dramatic that many cultural and technological historians have dubbed this as the fourth industrial revolution. So today's topic was especially fascinating because we have been discussing, and that was the topic of my yesterday's um, lecture to the faculty, distinguished faculty in academics here, was what we have done to technology. What, what changes our engineers, our technicians have brought about on technology side, like the Google Cloud, the artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, the big data, uh, you name it, social media, 3D printing, all these are very, very big inventions which we have managed to impact or influence on the technology side. Less well documented is how technology has affected us. <laughs> because with technological changes, we can say, okay, this is a version one, version two, the software is being upgraded. There is very little, in, in, so far as humans, we are also changing. But we really, obviously, do not have a very good measure to assess how we are changing. The 
most of us have lived through the 80s when we did not have in internet, obviously, and many of the features that we have now, we, if you have to make a phone call, you have to sit at one place and make a phone call, not go shopping and do all of the things while you are communicating. So various things have changed. So what we were in the six, seven, 80s or 90s, in 2000s and currently, we are actually different versions of ourselves, right? But we don't like to imagine, we don't like to say that. Said, okay, we, we, are, we are what we were, just technology has not affected us which is only partially true. Technology has not transformed us, but definitely has changed the way that we work, we think, and the way we approach life in general. So this is a humongous and a very big topic that maybe 50 years from now or in the future, if one was to document uh, the changes that we as a bridge generation, we were a bridge generation because we grew up at a time where there was no internet. And then we saw how gradually internet came to life. And perhaps we will live long, long enough to see how much changes has been brought about by this rapid um, trend towards digitalization. So uh, my effort in this uh, topic, in this, um, can I change this? I'm sorry. How do I? It's, you can hit the mic. Okay. Okay. So, okay. My effort in this uh, lecture would be to give you a flavor of um, how. I can't sing. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Okay. So let me begin this lecture by. Uh, discussing some of the disruptive themes in HR. And when I say disrupt disruptions, which um, has brought about primarily by the digital um, changes, not in, not in other socio-political and economic side. So the first change is that there is, we just talked about the digital mega trends. So a lot of the work that we do are no longer in physical space. That is, the data that you use is no longer in your personal desktop, right? The music that you listen is not in your tape or record or CDs. They are actually up in the sky, the Apple cloud, right? When you log on to these, these uh, online features. The videos that you, um, that you watch is no longer with uh, your cartridge tapes, you download them from YouTube and Netflix. Everything is now not in a physical space, but you are still able to access it. If you want to buy, you want to go shopping, then you really do not have to take the time off yeah. to go shopping. It's actually at the click of a button. Right. You can do it in the middle of the night, you can do it at any time of the hour. And the list goes on and on. Just look at your education system. If previously, if somebody has to consult the library, then you have to get up early in the morning. If you want to check out a book, go to the library before everyone else does, because somebody else may borrow the book before you do, if it's a popular book. You fill out, you check the um, cart, you know, this catalog, go to the particular uh, aisle, pick up that book, go to the librarian, have it issued, just for one article. You may not require the entire book, you just need the one article, then you used to Xerox it and keep it and so on. What do our students do th these days? They go to the virtual library. Yeah. They just Google, in fact, they have no idea what, what um, uh, the top, what, the, what uh, articles they are looking for because they'll just put it in the search mm -hmm. box and 10,000 articles come in, they select which one Millions, <laughs> I just understand. So, they, so what I'm trying to say is that the way information is accessed is become very different. To that point, I will also add, there was a very interesting discussion recently when someone said, um, is memory important anymore? Is it, is it, in academia we always emphasize that you should remember this. 
with Google and Siri, perhaps there is no need to remember anything. All you need is to ask, right? That is an extreme example, and I don't think as human beings we'll ever accept the fact that we should give up the control of our way we think or act. But even for elementary things, we do not really have to remember, we do not have to remember anyone's telephone number, right? So now we used to struggle with even f five digit telephone numbers, now even 10 digit does not bother us because all it needs is to tap on somebody's face. Yeah. So these are mega trends because it is not some isolated things. It is not um, in, on, a change in one particular device. To give you an example, when manual typewriters were replaced with electronic typewriters, it affected mostly secretaries because Typing used to be done in most offices by secretaries. Now, the whole concept of secretary in big organizations have almost disappeared because there are dictation tools, Dragon, there are many other tools, and there is, people would like to, you know, they find it much more easier to dictate uh, to a machine in the spare time when it's transcribed rather than to, um, you know, type it out physically. And even if they do, it's very easy with our software. So those are, were micro trends when change in one device was limited to only people who are using that particular device. Not everyone was using, was used to typing it out. But when, when there is a new version of, of smartphones, then it affects not just the people who are making telephone calls, but also people who are taking pictures, people who are recording events. So it inf involves a lot of people than, than just a tiny segment of users. The second point is that uh, now we have a multi-generational workforce. And this I have already touched on earlier, that the workforce of now consists not just of one type of people. In this room, we have what you call the traditional old guards, people who have been here for a number of time. There are millennials who have just, you know, in their late 20s, um, early 30s maybe, just about 30 years. And there are also much younger force people who are called digital citizens. For the, the way this, these three generations work are very different. The older generation have tried their best to keep pace with technology but they always have this feeling that they, are, they may be falling, sh falling short. That somebody else would always come up and say, um, hey, you're still using Facebook? <laughs> Even if you are enrolled in, in, in order to you know, sign up. So this is, th that is one part of it. So everything they do is not quite enough because the younger ones will still come up with something else. The millennials were really the people who actually grew up with the internet era, but even then they are not as dependent on technology because they have still have some links to the past, the earlier uh, legacy system as we call it. And so they are, they, are, they are comfortable both with the manual as well as with the electronic systems. The third part, the one is the digital citizens who have not seen a world other than a digital world. For them, everything is, um, they, 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 take, they take for granted the iPods, the, I, uh, you know, the, the iPads, and working from a smartphones. Um, there was a time when I used to, I'm sure many of us uh, as, as teachers used to ban even laptops in the class, right? No laptops. <laughs> Uh, absolutely no smartphones. Right. So, and we used to, uh, somebody used to s sneak in and then you should say, you should, uh, you know, capture his Facebook. See, now I have given up the battle. <laughs> because it is fighting with the, it's really, it's really like, as I said, in the, Ameri in the American state, it's like spitting in the wind. It will fall on your face. <laughs> so there is no, no, there's no point. If, if the world has, because they use it as a recording device, they are no longer taking notes, they are listening. 
and they actually complete a lot of homework from their phones. The way my, um, you know, I have, a, I, have two, I have two teenagers in my house and it always bothers me that they are responding, doing all the homeworks from their phones. I said, how can you compose any reasonable even sentence? Um, but that's, that's the way it is. They can type with, um, uh, with both fingers <laughs> and so on. So this, this generation has different needs and wants, different style of operation than the people who are normally in charge, who are the old guards or the millennials. So there has to be convergence between the way the working style and appreciation of each other's perspective rather than one size fits all, right? And we will come to uh, the, we, the um, issue of how the, that, that happens uh, in a more detailed manner. And the third one is hyper-connected workforce. Remember the time when 9 to 5 used to be the norm? <laughs> that we used to refuse to take up any phone calls after <laughs> work hours, right? No longer, because everyone is working or not working at the same time, right? During the day, cyber loafing is a huge part of it. In fact, people say that they come to office so that they can sit more comfortably and have a more faster network to do shopping or to catch up the news or to do all, you know, whatever they, they want to do. And actually the real work gets done then close to midnight when they are, the younger people are more active. They have more thought, they are more creative. So this whole parameter of coming, of having a defined time of coming onto office, punching the card, sitting at one place, you know, the traditional way is no longer the the, the, the accepted um, way of doing things because, because of the hyper-connectedness. So the world has become so global that half the, half the time when one part of the world sleeps, the other part is working, and the, when the other part is, and, and, and vice versa, right? So in fact, it helps because right now it's a 24-hour shift, especially in the computer world, when they're constantly handing off unfinished work to the next group. The next group works on it, and then after eight hour or 12 hour shift, they hand it over to this group and so on. That is how these call centers are operating. So now there is no such thing as you can call, um, you know, uh, call up a helpline 24 hours a day. And so this hyper-connectedness, not just by work, but also personally. So you get to know your colleagues uh, work, not just work, but about his family, the vacations he has taken, the food he has eaten, the, all the fun he had had, his views on politics, his views on culture, everything because he is there, not because you are, you are a detective, but because it is there, his, he is actually advertising it in the, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, right? So the concept of having, you know, remember the time when you used to, we used to maintain a diary to record our own personal thought and ensure that nobody reads it because it was so personal. In fact, there was to be a lock <laughs> on the diary sometimes. Now, unless you have taken a picture at the fancy restaurant that where you have eaten the food, people, you know, that, and, and unless you get like 200 likes in one hour, you don't think the food was good. <laughs> so this validation, this this validation among, our, among ourselves is a result of hyperconnected, the constant WhatsApp messages, constant Instagram updates, the Facebook. You, the, what, do you do, uh, what do most people do when they get up in the first thing in the morning? There used to be a time when it was the first thing, as my parents used to say, first, the first thing you get up from bed, you pray. <laughs> now the first thing most people do is to check the WhatsApp. Right? Who has, and you'll have a million good morning messages, <laughs> which is, and all kinds of blessings and so on, which, you know, you don't read them, but they are there. Um, same thing with, what, uh, maybe if you have put up a profile, you have changed your profile picture on Facebook, the, you get, your day is made or destroyed by the fact that how many likes you have received. 
so you gauge your popularity by this hyperconnectedness and this has this is not just anecdotal but is a impl very powerful implication about the way we approach work finally this is the uh, the 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 point that I'll be dealing with some detail is that mobility and flexibility are crucial for the digitally skilled employees. This is very different from the, and this is this is from the basis on the basis of surveys. Almost everything that I'll be talking to you um, is actually from experimental studies. I don't like to share opinions because opinions are free, <laughs> but uh, it has to be backed up by data. So I have a, a citation uh, bibliography which I have not been able to complete, but I'll be happy to share with you if, if you want to look at the, the evidence behind some of the statements. So um, this, is, this was on the basis of a 2014 study when they found out uh, what, what are the top two priorities for the digital skilled employees. And they felt that mobility, that the ability to work um, from anywhere, anytime, any place, and the flexibility to do what they want to do, rather than just give a, a, adhere to a prescribed format, is very crucial for the digitally skilled employees. And this, as we see, is different from the priorities of the earlier generation, where security and loyalty were the most highly valued aspects. So if, you, uh, if I were to say that uh, I worked in this organization for 10 years, okay, not in academics, but in, in the computer sector, then people will start doubting my ability of being employable. <laughs> so that is, is, is security and the longevity and tenure are no longer valued. In fact, they are considered to be blemishes. And the business models are under stress from digital disruption. This is an overarching, I have not, is this, okay. Is the, uh, I'll not be dealing with the business aspect of it because we are, we are focused on the HR aspect, but frankly, the, the digital, the business models are severely under stress because digitally, a lot of things that we have been, um, we are accustomed to, like those in marketing will be knowing that we have the four Ps, the place, production, uh, people, uh, and price, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so those are four P's and are out out to the market because price fixation, for instance, is no longer done on the basis of uh, on on a, on a strategy. It is actually in the part of your software. So if you are checking the same website repeatedly, like so if you're checking for a for an airfare from here to Bali, the because of dynamic pricing which is built into the digital system. If you click 10 times, then the prices will go up, <laughs> right? So you are advised to actually go and log on to some other system because just going in incognito also does not uh, uh, you know, matter. So what I'm trying to say is that many of the, pla the, the, uh, the place, place used to be where the logistics part of it, right? Where it was either source of production or source of distribution. Now, Amazon has maybe billions of stuff and it does not have a, you know, it, I mean, it has, really does not have a warehouse where it keeps most of the stuff. It's actually, uh, it, it sources it uh, from individual vendors. So a lot of these business models about uh, keeping, uh, uh, about what we, uh, which is re basically related to the physical models are no longer valid in the, when the, uh, the advent of cloud and um, artificial intelligence. So we, this being the disruptive themes, let us see what the, the digital transformation journey. And again, as I said, I would be restricting myself that to, to the HR part of it. And so there is no question that in order to survive, organizations have to embrace the ethos and processes of the digital era. We all know that, right? But however, the transformation process is not as easy and there is really no prescriptive norm to achieve it. And it requires a lot of preparation and reorganization before it can transform itself into, into a legitimate player in the digital space. So what are the requirements? So the first requirement, the sine qua non of any uh, digital transformation is to frame a realistic strategy, right? 
to not only survive but also be successful in the digital arena which means that the organization must make a conscious and a very decisive plan to transform to to to, to establish itself as a legitimate digital player once the strategy is in place the thought obviously turns to the required planning and operations to realize the strategy right so he said okay we are going to be ut is going to be the number one digitally advanced leader in online education open education in in southeast asia that decision has to be made with a lot of thought not just as a slogan too many times we like to say that we are digitally uh, we have computers we have uh, all infrastructures that is only part of the the um, the story because it requires virtually months years of planning sometimes to realize that what is what are we going to be in 5 years time in 10 years time because technology this technology is going to be obsolete and when we are going to replace it are we are we can we scale it up can this technology be in sync with whatever we are going to bring in future that look means that we have to look into the crystal ball of future and that is where a lot of consultants lot of thought leaders come into play you might have seen in youtube many time many people sometimes talk about very futuristic things like there will be no computers uh, like uh, just you know we, we just wave the hand and then we create and we say this is like is this a magic show <laughs> but remember a lot of things which we are doing now the fa fact that we are we are able to talk to each other at a distance this used to be like a magic show not too long ago so nothing is impossible in, in this arena and it is important for us to have a planning in place planning operations in place and the third crucial step in preparing for the digital journey is planning for the required manpower and the infrastructure this is the first part is intricately linked with the hr issues that we are talking about and the infrastructure is um, is obviously comes with that now next after having all these in place the task shifts to allocating roles and responsibilities associated with every position this is in fact a challenging issue as care has to be taken to ensure that the normal bureaucratic hierarchy is not replicated in the digital system unfortunately in many organizations especially in the public sector the supervisor roles are blindly replicated copied from the manual system and so this negates and defeats the very purpose of adopting digital technologies let me give an example let's say in a bank a counter clerk in the traditional system used to somebody used to withdraw money so they used to make a note in the the clerk used to make an endorsement on the withdrawal slip or the check enter into a ledger pass it on to the passing officer whoever sitting in the back that person will depending on the value and the amount which is withdrawn he or she has the authority to uh, approve it if it is a bigger amount or a more significant transaction then it goes props probably all the way to the bank manager this was the manual system because the system was paper everybody had the physical evidence that okay this is or oh, the, the bank manager may say oh, this signature does not match or who is this person so there are a lot of things which they could uh, by having different pairs of eyes look at it it was ensure it was designed to ensure um, security now what's happening let's say the same bank somebody goes and gives us gives the account number and says that this is my atm card or I want to make the withdrawal the account number comes in and then the bank um, the, the clerk looks at it and everything there's a balance and this is the correct number the pin pin is correct so he or she has actually the authority to approve it let's see however if the same system is now the, the computerization system it is replicated in the um, in the electronic system 
So what happens is, even though all there is no more ledger, however, there are different computers. Somebody is a bank clerk is approving, goes to the passing officer, he or she sees on screen, goes to the branch, branch manager screen. But the, in, the information is transmitted within seconds. But all these people, these three people may not be in the seat at the same time. The bank manager may be on the, on the phone. Somebody, uh, the uh, passing officer may be dealing with some other work. So there is the, the customer on the other end is really not getting the benefit as he or she should have, even though the data is now digitalized and passed it on in a information because there are still human beings involved in this process. So even though the, 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 the mechanism of data being transferred has changed from paper to the electronic system, we have, however, in many, many banks have still retained the manual system. So the customer on the other end does not reap the benefit. The inside story is that the bank may be saving money in terms of saving its paper and its record keeping function, but it's not trans transferred to the, to the end users. So when you are changing over to a, 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 any, any, any system which is changing over to a digital system, a lot of care has to be um, given to the fact that whether we are also changing the process while we are changing the system. It's not enough just to change the, uh, uh, change the system, the infrastructure, rather than any consequent changes in the process. So once you have these infrastructure and the manpower in place, you are, the organization is now prepared to embark on the digital talent life cycle. This is, that is, in simple words, how to get the right person for the right role, right? So the first thing, of course, is you get it from the market. Acquisition of talent, right? So in order to get the best talent, you, you have to take some special steps. And I should add that Unlike in the manual system, there is very little scope to learn on the job. Why? Because in the manual system, there was always used to supervisors who can train or guide you. And so there is a lag, time lag, let's say in the paper track, as we just mentioned. Somebody makes a mistake in the paper, the senior comes and supervisor comes and corrects it. And before it is released to the public, the problem, problem is taken care of. However, in an online system, if somebody makes a mistake online, then the same mistake or error is broadcast immediately, all over the world, right? And so once it is, uh, a mistake is done, it is no longer possible to correct it unless it is, it, uh, I mean, it, once in the internet, it is, it is in the public domain. So in a, in a digital system, um, there is very, very little scope for trial and error learning. And so the, the individual who has to be appointed for a, for a specific role has to be extremely skillful and talented to do the job. Um, in order to best attract the best of talents, the company has to position itself as a digitally progressive brand, right? So. Many people, many really talented uh, people fresh out of the campus, they do not really, are not just going with the brand name. They want to know that whether they will have the opportunity to really work in cutting edge technology if they join this organization. So a organization which does not have um, a, a tech savvy culture uh, or a um, place where they can actually develop and hone their skills in the, in the digital arena is, does not attract the best of talents. So talented specialists are not just attracted by a big salary and benefits, even though they are still important, but also on the basis, they, they judge an organization on the basis of its forward thinking and room for personal growth, right? So it is, organizations in the earlier era used to advertise a very big, um, very attractive salary benefits, 
and hope that and say, okay, I will give you housing, we'll give you transport, we'll give you, um, a, a, you know, so much leave. But along with that, the companies, the world, the top companies in the world, Apple, Google, uh, you name it, Microsoft, they are, they have, um, you know, in their website, they also have a uh, meditation room or a, uh, there is a chief happiness officer in Google whose job is just, uh, he, he, every day he comes, he makes, he, he smiles at people. <laughs> you think that these companies are just foolish companies. They are not. They, business, they are hardcore business people. What they are trying to do is create an atmosphere where the young and the really talented people are at home. There's a company called Zappos. You may, uh, may or may not have heard about this thing. It's a very prominent company. What it does is that it allows employees to bring their pets to, 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 the, to the workplace. Mm -hmm. And there is no, um, there is no uh, t uh, table and chair. They have sofas and uh, cushions and couches. A um, lot of people work from the floor. They're actually lying on the floor, working uh, with their dog by their side. And that company was voted as the number one, not just in uh, customer service. Their customer service is excellent. I have bought uh, shoes from them, and they are ex excellent, very helpful. Um, very, very um, empowered to take a decision to help the customers. But also that was considered to be the top uh, attraction for the young millennials to join, right? So th th those are the kind of positioning um, that the companies do. Now, however, uh, at the same time, um, not everyone you can, uh, can be bought from the market. The majority of uh, your employee will still be the in-house employees, the people who are there. You just, just because you have gone to digital, you can't sack everyone and say, okay, we are going digital and you are not, you are all analog and you can leave, <laughs> right? So you, you have to do the best you can with your existing manpower and that is where the challenge is. So you invest in, the, uh, in your existing manpower by training them, giving them opportunities. Tra training them adequately and th so that they can seamly, seamlessly transit into the digital operations. So the employees should also have a role in uh, the training um, and, uh, edu and, and t in the training and educational opportunities designed for them. This is actually very important. A lot of times we join training um, courses not knowing what we are there for, right? Because the feedback is always taken at the end of the training, not at the beginning of the training. <laughs> and by that time, it's too late because you're not coming back for the training at the same time. Maybe it will help the next batch, but not yours. So one of the things is that before you ask, take people for training, maybe weeks or months before that, you should ask, okay, this is a training for your mid-career development. What are the things you, are, you, are, you, are, you want to learn? And that can, believe me, give you a lot of insight into what people really want and what you think they want. At a personal level, um, uh, last year, we, I took over this new program. And this program was having a good enrollment, but we, I saw this, the enrollment was not, um, really not increasing. So one of the things is, and uh, when we get from student feedback, they were all happy. There were our instructors were getting good evaluations, but I thought that let me ask, let me do a survey about what students really want. And so we asked them. I we asked them what the um, uh, what kind of marketing topics they are interested in. And I was surprised that a large majority of them not only had a lot of background in marketing, but also they had very specific views about what they would like to learn. So while our topics, we thought that we had, uh, we had all the topics of consumer behavior, branding, ethics and law, ma market research, direct marketing, um, strategy, and, but the students opined that they wanted a course on digital analytics, on um, they want specific topics to be more coverage on social media, which of course we, we do cover, but they wanted the actual simulation a topic on that and a variety of other uh, other uh, areas which was was news to me so i uh, 
even though I consider myself a little more acquainted with the technology part of it because I've been working in that area, but I still did not feel confident about the digital marketing. So I went and took a two certification courses, which was very tough at this stage and age <laughs> to get a new certification is not easy. But now I feel and we are unrolling a new uh, course on digital analytics and already we have more than 100 students who have applied for that and which is probably going to be one of the more successful courses hopefully. So asking people, if I had not asked, if I had assumed going just by the feedback that everything is going, you know, as, as, the, um, as there is a saying that uh, if it is not broken, don't fix it, right? So that's the, uh, that's the, we don't want to be proactive. We said, okay, if it is, everything's going well, why bother taking this? Because right now, uh, it's easy for me to, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy, but uh, the difficulty is not, does not lie so much in offering a new course, but finding the new faculty. All our faculty are PhDs and they are very, very good in their space, but not they, I don't think many of them are really qualified to, you know, teach search engine optimization or web analytics like um, so uh, the, probably uh, the first few courses I have to teach myself uh, and so on. So this, this taking uh, of an offering educational training opportunities is very crucial. Preparing the manpower is also very, very important. And fostering a digital culture, that is very important. You can't have a you can't just have a claim yourself to a digital organization, a, 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 a technology adept organization without fostering a climate from the top person downwards. Which means that from today, um, you, you, there's, it has to be a mantra that everything that we do, let's have it on the Google Docs or a Dropbox. No formal demi-official letters. No, uh, this thing. I mean, just to just in order so that the people know that okay, we are actually walking the talk and not just saying something that you don't, uh, you're not ready to in, 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 you know implement yourself. So these are um, that allows the organization to be to be to be uh, not just be in um, in words but also in deeds. I'll quickly go on to that. So, engagement, retention of digital talent pool. A lot of times you have, uh, you, you, you manage to recruit some people, but they leave you with, after a short period of time. And because mobility and flexibility is very important to them, so they don't really care about, you know, the loyalty part of it. So all the training, all the investments that you have made, on the planning that you have made, really falls apart because those employees do not stick to your organizations. So retaining the highly qualified individual employee talent pools is even more challenging than hiring them. So organizations in the digital era use a variety of strategies to make the workforce more collaborative and the workplace more interesting. By collaboration, we mean the you know, increasing use of digital platforms such as using wikis and shared work folders that are archived in the teamwork space in without multiple meetings and uh, email exchanges and promoting flexible hours and working from home and you know, lucrative reward structures that are all geared towards engaging the digital workforce. This is very important, especially when a large segment of a population, women are joining in a huge uh, numbers in the, in the, especially in the technological field. And achieving a work-life balance is very difficult, given the fact that these are, uh, some of these, uh, they are in very important and sophisticated position. So unless they have the flexibility of uh, working, um, you know, in working location hours, and also making, a, also establishing a reward structure, um, it, it is not going to be an easy um, transition, um, e easy role for, especially for those who, who require to sp spend time at home as well. Empowering digital leadership. 
By this I mean that increasingly the digital worker is also sought to be transformed as digital leaders. So this involves empowering managers at various leadership level to understand the overall organization goals so they are able to handle the issues that arise from multiple cross-functional teams working on sophisticated projects. Essentially what I mean is that, that even though you may be a member, a, 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 you are not in the leadership structure, you are not in the top management, but you should be aware of what your organizational goals are. It does not really depend on your pay, pay level or your position in the organizational hierarchy, but unless you know that, okay, this is what you are trying to achieve, this is the organizational strategy, that this is um, what the organization as a whole is going towards, Without that understanding, you cannot assume leadership. You'll always be an employee rather than that a leader. So the top management's leadership's job is to get everyone on board, not just a select few, not just the top um, leaders of different departments, let's say in the university context. It has to be a sharing of ideas and one of the key uh, in our university in East Maryland, our president Javier, <coughs> who is a very data driven, um, he was, he was he's, he's from the IT background and I've had the opportunity to work with him when he was vice president earlier on in 2008 and 9. Uh, one of the things that he has introduced very effectively is to um, have a town hall meeting every month that is open to everyone in the university, right? So what happens in the town hall, even things that does not really concern us, but what collaborative um, initiatives taken by the university top leadership, what is the changes, let's say, in the uh, military funding going to affect us? Uh, how is, how are we going to, what are, the, what are the results of a marketing survey done by, you know, the marketing group? Um, tell us and on that basis there is a continuous discussion b among all stakeholders so that even though our, we as faculty do not really have the military funding but we know okay military funding is going down so we have to make good on the civilian population as well right and so on so organizational goals are should not be limited within the boardroom but they should be shared as much as possible without giving away your um, trade secrets, to, because transparency is the best antidote to deterioration in culture. Once you have a transparency, sunshine of all, everyone comes to know, then people do have a, do, are able to jump in and offer some suggestions that you may not, may not be aware of. I have uh, many examples that we can, I can share later, but let's do, um, uh, cover this uh, presentation first. Um, I should mention, uh, before going there, like recently I used a Facebook page, created a Facebook group to students to solicit their opinions about how we can improve enrollment. So normally you don't uh, involve students in that, right? You just have, because we have a very good marketing group, they do a lot of work. But one of the students said, why don't we have more, um, you know, uh, go into areas and, you know, uh, uh, do this, a series of steps in the Facebook um, um, post she has, she shared. Uh, what he said, why don't you actually show on the video how we actually teach in the classroom? Because there are a lot of videos of our vice chancellor and the president and everything talking on this thing, but the average student is not impressed with that. Mm -hmm. They want to see actual, an actual class with all its messiness and all its, uh, you know, in American classrooms are very uh, not as structured. Somebody is, uh, you know, drinking coffee. Somebody is uh, doing something. But that is realistic. And I, I was surprised. I said, okay, let me pitch this idea. And the marketing group was initially hesitant because they wanted to make it everything clean and, you know, looking glossy, not in the typical classroom, which is not. But they, uh, that particular webcast has attracted more comments and more engagement from prospective clients than all our glossy videos and uh, multimedias. Mm -hmm. So th this kind of feedback is only possible when you actually involve everyone, all the stakeholders in your decision making. 
Um, financial acumen, uh, we also, uh, um, every employee should also have the, uh, should also be given you know, some kind of a finance, understanding the economics part of it, which is very important because they should know at least uh, what, what ventures are worth taking from an organizational point of view because we, at the end of the day, we need money to survive. And so having just fancy ideas, um, it does not work. So they also have to be in, involved in what, what might work and what may not. And entrepreneurial skills, that the genuine entrepreneurial skill at every level. Uh, for instance, Google pioneered the concept of employees working on their personal project on 20% of their company time, right? So the most successful Google's business is Google AdWords, right? That's how they make the advertisement. I mean, you, you give the money and then that's how the, the money was actually done, not, was not invented by the Google's strategy team, but by individual employee working on their, spare, on, on their, on their own personal project. So they, what the employee does is they make a project and then they would lease, lease it out to the same company and get some royalty from the company, but the company wins because they take, you know, they would, uh, uh, instead of dealing with a private person, they actually know with the inside um, person. So th the entrepreneurial skills, so the employees also feel that, okay, if they are, they are actually adding value to their own skill set, so it's not just they are adding value to the organization, but also to their own employability and their own you know, sustainability even after they are no longer in the job. So that is very, very important in the new era. So we have talked, talked we have we've looked at it from the employee point of view, and we now look at the leadership. So in the digital era, leadership involves a combination of an ability to promote collaborative efforts, even while nurturing individual excellence. So what this means is that uh, we are, we obviously like, want to have outstanding employees, all of us do, but we also require them that they should be good team players. That is why the concept of emotional intelligence, which you may have, uh, may have heard uh, discussed quite a bit, comes in. That they are not only individually excellent, but also excellent team players. So it calls for leaders to be adaptable to idiosyncratic styles without imposing a one-size-fits-all style of work culture. That is, um, they have, the employees have the freedom to innovate and different individuals have different styles of working. Some people are very good in uh, their personal skills. They are very good in interpersonal maintaining um, uh, relationships while some others, maybe they may uh, talk, uh, speak very less, or they may be very little gruff in their style of working, in, in the style of speaking, but they're excellent workers. You need all types. <laughs> you do not, you just don't need um, people who are, who just want to sing your praise, but do nothing, right? So th those kind of people are, uh, will not survive in the digital environment because it is very difficult um, because they will, call, they will be accountable. It's, you can no longer hide behind fancy words in a digital environment. You are as good as, it, uh, as you are performing. Everything is being recorded. Um, instead of in, like in a meeting, when you don't have to, you, you may not speak a lot, but if you have to share a collaborative document, people will see the comments you have made in that spreadsheet and how good they are. Tolerance. Tolerance for experimentation and innovations is extremely important. This means that while success is recognized, failure in spite of sincere efforts should not be condemned. Too many times, we, um, you know, we, we always talk about people who are successful, the projects which are successful. We do not like to talk about projects which are failures. Even though, as uh, ma'am would know, that in, in, the, in the business, 80% of innovations fail, <laughs> right? 80% in, of all innovation, innovative products fail and services. But that does not mean that because, you know, we, those, we will only focus on 20% and uh, sack or discourage the 80% because failure, because every failure teaches us something that we can 
make use of in the next round to be successful. So this, this acceptance of the fact that this is a learning process, that employees will make mistakes, uh, that there is no such thing as a magic, a silver bullet, and promote and encouraging them even when even while they are failing is very important aspect of a organizational leadership mobility mobility is considered to be extremely important for the digital worker uh, the freedom to work at a, uh, to work at a time and place of one choosing then the company's imposed 9 to 5 schedule is deemed to be the number one priority for the for many of the current workers so as I mentioned, the flexibility in working time is particularly appreciated by women who constitute a significant part of the digital workforce. And finally, the collaboration, the composition of the workforce now is much more complex and diverse than any in the previous years. Many of the segments of a population which have been traditionally left out in the traditional culture um, regardless of their gender, their racial, or um, the age, diversity, they are now in the workplace. So promote, promoting collaborative work between diverse sets of workforce can be a very challenging task, right? So it requires skills and patience to ensure that these diverse groups work with each other without conflicts or misunderstanding. This part is actually the diff most difficult part. Um, and I have, as a personal, as a person from uh, India and Asia, having worked for the past two decades in U.S., I actually um, had a ringside view of how cultures, um, cultural differences can be. Um, I'll just share with you a one-minute um, anecdote of myself. When I first joined the Wharton School, it was a very uh, top school, and the professor was uh, very tough to work with. And so he gave me a project to analyze a set of um, um, advertising um, data. I took that, um, I struggled with that, and the professor was very nice to me, but he, whatever I, I did and suggested to him, it was not appreciated by him. Uh, he was not very, um, I mean, he didn't say it was wrong, but he said that I certainly can do better. So after two months of working in that atmosphere, I started having doubts about many things. First of all, about my own abilities. Uh, secondly, I thought, oh, maybe let me be very open about it. I was the only non-white in that entire department. I said, maybe because of that. Uh, so you know, when you are not succeeding, doing well, you start looking for reasons. It's the human nature. So one day I um, decided that um, I will just quit because it's not going well. And so he, I took these uh, things from him and then we started. Um, then he said, okay, uh, before you leave, um, can you tell me what exactly, why, what's your opinion about this project? So by that time I was so depressed. So I thought that, okay, if I'm leaving, I might as well tell the truth, right? Because till that point of time, my attitude was to say what he wanted to hear, as we did. Because I was a civil servant, remember, right? So as an Asian, as a civil servant, I always wanted to tell what my bosses want to hear. Because that was his project. He's been working for 30 years. I didn't want to say something different. So I said, uh, what the heck? Now I'm quitting in any case. Uh, thing. So I said, um, I don't know. I'm not an expert. But I don't think that your approach would work. He was absolutely stunned. <laughs> he said, um, why? Uh, then I gave him some reasons. Uh, he did not really accept it, but he said, OK, um, why don't you go back and work on this a little more? I told him, um, I'm not going to accept any payments, because this is something which is, he said, no, I was not going to pay you anything, so you can <laughs> rest assured. Uh, long story short, uh, I came back and wrote what I really felt and then present it to him. And he was so happy that he called the entire team and he said, this is the path-breaking thing and this is, why don't you think it before? A lot of good things. Uh, so on one day, I was the village idiot, and next day, I was a genius, right? Yeah. I have not changed. 
So I was analyzing what, I, what, what was the factor? What was this thing? And then I realized that I did not um, share my honest opinion about his work, not because I was just flattering him, not just as flattering him. Because we have this back of mind, I was respectful for his authority, for his age, and for the fact that he is a very learned man. As we Indians, we always have, or Asians, we have a lot of respect for elderly. We don't want to hurt somebody, you know, the, the face. Americans, in their culture, if you are, if he, his point of perspective, however, was that I was, they want your honest opinion. That if in the meeting, if you are not saying something original, then you have no reason to be in that meeting. Okay, so what the, the common expression is, what are you bringing to the table? Do you have any new ideas? Or are you just come here to uh, you know, have your tea and snacks and leave? <laughs> Which was what the, my life was before, we, when I was in a bureaucratic setup. We did not, uh, there was no question of disagreeing with your boss, in, at least in public. And that was a very useful lesson uh, in this thing. And then later on, I felt that, um, while nobody wants an argument, obviously, but honesty and transparency in what exactly you should express, exactly how you feel, rather than suppressing it, was important. Now, that is the American culture. But American workers, uh, managers, when they came to India, had a lot of problems. Because the Indians, and I think most Asians would say, are you married? Do you have children? Where do your parents stay? And they find it very, very intrusive. And you know, why, why should you hear, you know, ask me those questions? Mm -hmm. um, and the Indian, uh, the, uh, the Asian uh, culture is that we, we are asking them uh, not to be just intrusive, but they want to have a familial connection. Yeah. That we look up to our colleagues and our um, workplace is also an extension of our family culture. Right? So most of the time, in India, we used to begin our um, meetings by saying, we are all part of the family. I've never heard that expression in the US even 22 years. <laughs> Nobody has called me family, even though we really have gone, gone out golfing with this thing. So it's, it's, it's that in, individual, nobody's right or nobody's wrong. It's just a way of perspective. Getting this um, cultural divides and work, having a meaningful uh, working uh, culture is, is a big challenge and it takes time. So uh, let's proceed to the next. Uh, this is the continuation. I'm sorry, is it not? Uh, did we disconnect or I don't know? It's still there? Oh, OK, I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, we'll, uh, leadership in digital environment is that the decision-making ability, today's management decisions are basically, based largely on analytics, right? So company leadership, uh, contemporary leadership involves identifying the right analytical tools as well as the metrics to gauge performance. Management in this era depends on a team of highly specialized uh, group of people to um, advise and to give the correct data. And decisions are made, made on the basis of results and evidence rather than on personal opinions. This is a significant change. Uh, near Philadelphia, where I live, we have been having this marketing campaign for a university for quite some time. So when the marketing groups ask for my advice, I will say that, okay, why don't you, um, I mean, I'll give you a few names, the students who have, I have seen, I've taught them in class, and so they would go and approach them and so on. So this time I heard, I, I uh, was in a part of a training on uh, Watson Analytics, which is um, IBM's very powerful tool. So they have implemented that in our university. So I asked uh, Brad, the IT guy, I said, hey, Brad, uh, instead of my remembering all the students, why don't you take this zip codes, this pin codes, and then find out uh, who the students may have been. He published, he got out a, on the basis of four or five pin codes, zip codes, he got out a list of close to 500 students. Now, this data would not be amenable to people, even if I was in a paper pencil test. This is, this is basically on, on the, because he, they just did a query, right? Query search, and they got it. So now, decisions are based 
on on um, on mostly on data on the evidence based data and less on experience and on personal opinions so communication open and accessible communication at all, across all as I, we talked about transparency the biggest benefit of a of a digital environment is that it it enables you to share information quickly and to a large population in the shortest possible time like you send out one email broadcast and you copy everything every in the everyone in your mailing list so everyone has the same information uh, at at all grade levels and feedback provide real time feedback reward individual team achievements the traditional system of for instance the uh, personal assessments used to be that you used to sit to uh, you know spend weeks um, or days after your academic year is over and then to write the personal evaluations right i did this and then last year now it is actually real time feedback our university has opened a um, has launched a new app actually called workday uh, so every time i, do, I we do some anything we actually record it it's like google calendar so for instance suppose i, I give this lecture today so i am able to upload it right away by by there's a merge facility with the calendar so that at the end so that my supervisor at any point of time can access my information the dean can access my information at any point of time rather than wait for me to provide a big essay at the end of uh, you know after 12 months so this is a real time feedback so and reward individual and team achievements that is crucial in fact i should mention that this my being nominated to come to indonesia was based on a similar uh, system because i had uploaded my current research on management style in in the in the uh, uh, my my portal and so my dean catherine close she said um, i sandeep i was looking at your this thing and would you be interested because otherwise the dean would not be knowing what i was doing so this is this is the opportunity where it you can the real time feedback can help and empower um, employees at different uh, levels will so the we'll talk about what uh, this is the employee versus management expectations what employees think their managers want want and the other column is what managers actually want right so many times uh, employees think that the top 3 requirements is that learn and be trained quickly that is they think that the management wants them to be they uh, have loyalty and long term commitments job performance and results that these are the tip, top 3 priorities this was actually on based on a um, almost an interview of more than 4000 uh, people in the in the smart organizations and the managers actually wanted high level of education and training that's the first one loyalty is the same and the ability to be to learn and be trained quickly so there was an emphasis on in terms of um, em em employees still think that managers wanted want them to be to be loyal uh, and and show just results while the managers the managers actually wanted them to be come prepared to work and not have any lag in their performance and ability to learn a bit trained quickly that is that is something which is which is uh, desirable for most uh, top managements <clears throat> this was the survey which is uh, oxford economic surveyed more than 40 41 executives this was one of the ground breaking studies and in 21 countries and across multiple industries in 2016 they found that companies that get digital leadership right perform better in the marketplace and have happier and more engaged employees so this is a win win situation because not only are the workers being employees being productive but they are also more engaged and more happier and so these highly fun high function organizations are known as digital winners this is a term which they have coined however the bad news is only you know 16% of the companies qualified as digital winners leading in transformation and mind you all these most of these companies were actually in the tech sector so in spite of the fact that they are in the technology sector and they do a lot of digital work they they are not really um, 
considered, the organizational climate is not considered to be um, digital winners. <clears throat> um, so features, what, what makes the features of a digital winner? Digital winning companies are 38% more likely to report strong revenue and growth, right? That's the bottom line of companies, that whether you are actually being productive or not. So there's a 76% versus 55% of others. Like 55% are the non-digitally, um, digital winning organizations, and 76% are people who have adopted the, the, everything that we have discussed. They have more mature strategies and programs for hiring skilled talent, that is 85% or 64%. So they have, it's not just hiring from the open market, just putting up a advertisement. They have a more diligent system of vetting applicants and getting them selected. They have, they are better at building diversity. Their succession planning is also, also great. Succession planning is who will take, take up the leadership after the top management goes, right? So many times it is, in traditional organization, it is just one charismatic person who is at the head of the organization, but after he or she leaves, there's really not much of a planning in terms of who will take it over. In contrast, just look at Warren Buffet's Berkshire company. They have been working for years, almost five years now, Warren Buffet has been training his next line of people to take over from him as and when he retires. Employees were more satisfied and they are more likely to stay in jobs if given the chance to leave. So these are, these, these, all these features make um, a digital winner a, 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 a great company. And as you, you, those of you who have, are acquainted with um, OB, organizational behavior, HR, would also recognize that these are, these are also the features of companies who have, who are built to last. That companies who, who have performed consistently well over de decades, also have the same, uh, same, same indices as these, these uh, digitally oriented companies do. And so how executives can drive digital transformation? We've talked a lot about the, uh, many of the aspects then where the HR planning can, can promote uh, a more digitally capable uh, workforce. So as from the executive level, they, have, they can embrace digital technologies, execute on a company-wide digital vision, embed technology in all aspects of the organizations. So to say that, is there something that we can do um, in order to, for our co company to be, organization to be more tech savvy? Streamline decision making, make data-driven decisions in real time, distribute decision making all the organization. This is actually making the organizations flatter. To, so it's not just a pyramid structure where every, all the decisions are taking place by the one or the head of the company. It's actually more inclusive and making, making it more shared. Uh, next line is flatten the organization, focus on reducing complexity and bureaucracy, offer the latest technology to all employees. And of course, build a digital workforce, improve digital proficiency among managers and employees, emphasize transformation readiness and strategic use of technologies. That is, a lot of times technology is actually given, the hardware is given, but not training is not commensurate. So in many top executives, um, there is a glowing you know, screensaver in the back of their office, but they don't get either a chance to work on it, or nobody really teaches them how to make the best use of it. So technology adoption is a continuous process. It is not a one-off training that you are given a fair, 10 days of training and then you go back as digital leaders. It has to be a continuous effort. It has to be a continuous investment. It is not cheap. It is definitely not cheap. Um, get the example of DHL. Now DHL, as you know, is a, is a courier company which, has, which is in heavily invested in package um, deliveries. But its biggest share of, of investment is now in networking, in, in, the, in the service. And why does it do it? Because it does, it, it always did the delivery great, but now the current customers need tracking at every second, right? Everywhere where it is going. So they have, they invested almost a billion dollars in having, uh, installing their data network and um, basically sending the executives repeatedly 
on technology training. It's not just a one-off. So anyway, so we have come to the almost the end of the uh, this thing, and so I would finally conclude that uh, on the leadership imperatives in the digital era. So what exactly is a we, to sum it up, digital should be a way of life, not just a buzzword. Uh, employees, especially senior, sorry, senior executives, should embrace digital technologies to achieve competitive advantage, facilitate involvement, collaboration, manage global diverse workforce. So if you are, um, your students are, you are expecting students to submit their uh, their, their uh, research papers online, then try to use a kind of a, a, a digital uh, service, like let's say for instance, to give you an example, traditionally we used to welcome new students with a um, letter saying welcoming to the student, those things and so on. I found that I, I actually did an end of a survey, I asked some students in the, in the, in the commencement, the graduation ceremony, I said, do you, um, how many of you really wrote that letter that I sent it out to you? <laughs> and there were a lot of smiles and embarrassing things. I, I figured that nobody did, right? Because it's, it's a server, sir, it was a very long letter. I said it was meant to be because you are just stepping into, I wanted to give you, tell you how you use the library, how you should come for the finance. So all my great letter came to no use because nobody reads it, right? So this time I said, okay, let's do it different. We used a software called Loom, L-O-O-M. It's actually a, uh, what we did was your face is on one corner of the video and then later on, so we took a, uh, some pictures with a camera, not with any sophisticated project, this thing. Took some pictures and then we talked about these things. This is a student financial office. This is something if you can go to the cafeteria. And beyond that, I was like the Loom, another, um, feature we did in the YouTube. That um, feature was actually, I, I saw that it has been viewed multiple times because actually one can see that. I, I don't know how many people have read my email, but I can see if they have liked my, or at least viewed my, uh, my video, that they have actually viewed it, right? So we, our way of communication has to also change because the world is changing and we have to constantly new things are coming up. So we, we can no longer be content with just Skype. Skype used to be very powerful, but it's, it, there, are, there are many features, new, new things have come up. Let's adopt that. Many of them are free, many of them you have to make an investment, it's worth it. View diversity as an investment. So diversity has a positive impact on financial performance. It is not just you know, trying to appear to be good or human. It is actually, if you have different points of view, then it enriches the conversation. Diversity growth among mid-level and senior executives is slow. This has to be promoted. Listen to millennial executives. Uh, we can no longer dismiss the younger um, uh, employees as saying they don't know, they don't have the wisdom. Uh, they definitely lack the experience. We have the experience, but they, have, they know a lot of things that we don't. Accepting it is difficult because our position in the hierarchy sometimes forbids us. Uh, to accept um, our ego does not allow how is this this system analyst is giving me opinions about how to conduct the meeting <laughs> I've been doing that for 30 years that is that have happens um, natural to happen but that is more a reflection uh, of our insecurity than uh, anything so try to be open and invest in your workforce um, they are more likely to express loyalty through organizations uh, employees of digital winning companies and um, engagement is, is critical and very satisfied employees routinely go beyond the minimum requirement of the, of the jobs which as we know that uh, most organizations f uh, emphasize on job satisfaction right but a very inefficient employee the um, in, in inefficient employees sometimes are the most satisfied employees Right? Because they, they think that, okay, I can do with very little work and my job is, payment is great. So that's not what we are looking for. We are not gunning for job satisfaction. We should be in looking for job involvement. That is the ability to go beyond the, just the prescribed list of duties. And that, that kind of employees would, uh, would really go beyond the call of uh, duty and um, and enrich not just their own personal worth, but also the organizations. So this is a quick. This was a quick review of um, the, the the digital journey, 
Uh, it's a huge topic, so obviously a, a one lecture will not be able to do justice to it. But um, thank you for hearing me out, and I'll appreciate um, um, if you have any questions, and I'll be, I'll be glad to respond to them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was the public lecture from uh, Mr. Sandeep. It is very excellent and challenging for Universitas Terbuka. Right. And then my comments is, I have several comments. Uh, first one, uh, we have IT person in each unit, uh, whether in the, both in central office, head office, and the regional center. So we, we thought that uh, this is, uh, IT person is very important for running this university. And then the second one is relating to the, uh, was, uh, how to prepare the digital talent in the work, workplace, like in Ute, uh, we we already use the, the technology since uh, the beginning, like in the 1984. So we really know that uh, we really aware that uh, technology is very important for us. And then the third one in about entrepreneurial spirits that you mentioned. It is very uh, useful for uh, engaging the what's the uh, talent in the digital era, and we we include the entrepreneurship course courses in our program, especially in the business administration program and the several programs in the Universitas Terbuka, and then the fourth one about teleconference study group. You also mentioned that. Uh, we have uh, offering several fully online programs in Universitas Terbuka, uh, uh, undergraduate and graduate programs. So we have uh, quite some students uh, enrolling in those programs. And then the fifth one, I guess, the when you mention about uh, features in the digital era, it is very uh, important, I guess, like. Uh, how it will be the environment of the uh, in the workplace that uh, ha can lead the organization. It is like building diversity and then succession. It is more more planned and then the employees more uh, satisfied, right? And then the uh, they choose to stay. <laughs> then to leave, and as you know, uh, Universitas Buka more most of us is a public service, public servant. So maybe we we don't have a chance to move to another place. Okay, I guess the, that's the best public lecture. I, I we come to the next section. It is like question and answer. Uh, Maybe I would like to divide to several sections. And the first section, uh, I would open to three questions. Anybody want to have inquiries in the regional centers? Hello? <laughs> Batam? Teman-teman di Batam, ada yang mau bertanya? Pangkal Pinang? Uh, Ya. Yeah. Oh ya. Yeah. Oke, okay, uh, teman-teman bisa menggunakan you can use Indonesian language and then Pak Daryono would <laughs> translate it. Oke, okay, please bahasa Indonesia. Anybody want to ask, to ask questions? No? Oke, okay, I open in here. Colleagues, please. Any questions? Oke, okay, Pak Pak Darmanto, and then Pak Usni, uh, and then Mas Joko ya. Yeah. Please mention your name and your questions, please. Uh, as you know, uh, UT has several regional units, 
sakit tentang vokal area dan sebagainya. And um, in especially in shopping student, whether they should decentralize or centralize in the use of digital resources. Thank you very much. Okay, and then Pak Usni, Mr. Usni. The one, uh, oh, okay, Mr. Sunny would like to answer uh, the two questioner, please. Um, both are excellent questions, and um, probably I, I'm not sure if I can do justice to it in a short um, response. But <clears throat> to your question about uh, what is the most important aspect of um, education and uh, implementing technology in the educational sector. The, you must remind me the second part of your question, but first let me answer this. Is um, There are various ways. One is, of course, you must recognize that not, not all the students are equally tech savvy, so they have to be really, many of them suffer, and when I say them, I include both the faculty as well as the students, what is called a technophobia. Technophobia is just, just fear. If I press this button, then everything disappeared. <laughs> In the paper, there is no fear, right? You can always retrieve it. But sometimes, like, a screen goes blank or the computer crashes. So it's this reassurance that um, nothing is, you know, this can be, don't fear. If something goes wrong, we'll, we'll deal with it. Or you learn to take copies and keep backups and so on. So it's, it's a gentle process. It, it can be very intimidating for somebody, let's say, from very rural areas who has never really been acquainted with it and you start um, giving him or her a lot of online um, assignments and things that they, they have to, like one simple thing, like when we started a, uh, making a PowerPoint presentation and we asked them to give a voiceover so that they are making a presentation uh, many of them are very petrified because they had never spoken in public before, right? So uh, getting technology um, a, a helping hand and having a very strong uh, tech support which is available 24 hours and who are patient people who will not um, just make judgments about you. Sometimes, you know, you, there, is a, there was a joke about like um, uh, the, in, a, in a cooking recipe Somebody followed the entire cooking recipes about adding oil, sugar, etc., etc., and then finally, when they cooked after one and a half hours, there was nothing. It was not uncooked because there was no instruction to light the stove. <laughs> this is a joke, I mean, but many times, like unless sometimes the people do not connect to the power cord or do not have this thing, and they panic. So getting that uh, fear over is um, is is important. The Another question which I have really spent some thoughts about is what I would call a social presence in the online classroom, right? Which is very, very, very different because in traditional classroom setup, people are gathered like in this, this thing, so they know each other and the presence. But when you are a, a distance education um, uh, in, in online education, the students do not sometimes are sitting in isolated, some one person sitting somewhere. They do not have the sense of belonging to a group, right? So this, this is what uh, is we should foster, try to foster a social presence. How do we do it? It is not, uh, it's not easy, but by having maybe a small module where they can post 
uh, anything you know, like light-hearted or current topics, something which which is not graded. Because if they do for grading, they will be very serious, right? Or you say, um, have them uh, like take the birthdays and then wish them, today is somebody's birthday, let's all celebrate. So there will be like 25 posts on that. But at least that person say, okay, I'm being recognized. I'm being, um, you know, I am important to this group. So there are various ways. Um, another thing which has really helped um, me and my colleagues is that we, if we have any issues, we directly call that person on telephone. Many of the faculty are afraid to share their phone numbers because they will get phone calls in the middle of the night and who, who bothers that. There will, that, is, that is a downside, but at the same time, if you say that, hey, I am available whenever you are, even if nobody calls you, they know that you are accessible, right? So social presence and having a human face behind these learning platforms is very important, but no amount of your um, uh, reading list or your scholarly journals can really replace that teacher-student relationship, uh, in, 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 which is there in the in the ordinary traditional classroom. So many of the uh, students also are working professionals. They also have a lot of high anxiety level uh, of whether you know whether they can do this degree with all everything employment so having a having a um, kind of a genuine interface sometimes um, i have set up these meetings with um, students who are not able to meet me physically and many times they i have uh, seen them cry uh, because somebody's mother is suffering from cancer somebody's child is a disabled child you know so many things happen we don't know about them if we're in the traditional this thing, we meet, meet everything, at least we get to know about them. But for us, we just grade them, right? We, okay, you have not done this, you, so you fail, you do this and pass. So th that robs, uh, we don't have the opportunity to get to know them because of our, of our digital existence. So we need to have, think creatively as to how to make the best use, use of digital as well as having a human face. That is the, the thing. Was there any other question? I uh, was there a second part to your question, or I, I, did I answer both? Yeah. Uh, UK has a uh, regional centers uh, integration. Yes. 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 Uh, right. 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 So, um, great question. Um, question is that now that you have a central database, actual digitalization helps in reintegration. That is, a lot of things that we, which were used to be um, in the regional areas, can be centralized. And so it is, um, it is, it is, I would say, a, um, advisable because it is, it is, it is, uh, you are able to do that. A lot of um, centralized, um, sorry, uh, learning material. For instance, let's say ethics. Let's take up ethics. Ethics is in law, in economics, in marketing, in uh, many other, in financial finance, right? So if I have, if I as a uh, marketing professor have find a good article on ethics in business and I post and put it into a shared base, then she, well, she is working, you know, in, in, you are working in law and ethic or in social sociology or something, you can actually retrieve that information from a common database. Mm -hmm. It has, does not have to be ethics in the law department, or law program and the same thing because um, I can, I, I now have a basket of goods in one centralized database. So you, uh, your colleagues sitting in different areas of, the, um, of Indonesia do not have to reinvent, mm -hmm. do not have to make that effort. They have to first scan through the list and if they find that, okay, the, they can make use of some of these tools, they can certainly do that. What happens is then as the organization grows, we tend to build up too many rooms. Right? And many of the rooms, new programs come up, new mm -hmm. centers come up. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that when you, the original house was, had a certain plan, mm -hmm. but when these new small rooms come up, they ultimately may completely uh, destroy the configuration of the original planning. Mm -hmm. So what we call it as silos, right? So we become, we build up silos. Mm -hmm. My law legal department, legal, uh, uh, this thing program does not talk to the economics department mm -hmm. unless we have something uh, we meet in meetings. So we do not really know. I could have used that, um, uh, you know, his talent, the expertise, and then many of the people I can call uh, a, a economics professor to talk in my law class, right? And so that kind of uh, so if you have a centralized 
academic pool with everybody's expertise, all the research being shared and known across different units, then that would be good for all. At the same time, one has to be mindful that regional centers have a very big role because they understand their target community, as this gentleman pointed out, they are, you are composed of different ethnic groups or different needs and requirements. So they know the sitting there, they are more able to know the ground condition in maybe Sumatra and Borneo and other places than you sitting in Jakarta. So there is, there is, uh, there needs to be a lot of thinking. What I'm thinking is strategy. It is not because all the time we can work mindlessly or we can work mindfully. <laughs> we need to know that, okay, all these, this thing, how do I um, make the best uh, use of everything you have? So to answer to your second part question is, so far as technology is concerned, access to information can definitely be centralized. However, the inputs at various levels, also there should be some decentralization so that we can make you best of the local talent. Did I answer the question? Thank you. Um, to his question, I think he um, referred to about the leadership. <coughs> um, forget what was this actual question. Uh, He's not there. Yeah. About leadership in the diverse cultural background. Yes. Yes. So a, a leader does not. One should be very um, careful about using the leader. Leader does not making about somebody who gets up to make speeches. <laughs> Normally we think that he is the big man, he or she is the, somebody who is an authority figure. That leadership is obsolete. What we are looking for leadership is leadership in ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have a, um, somebody from a regional center who has intimate view of uh, knowledge about the local conditions, then he or she is able to contribute something to, uh, to add to your knowledge base that what, okay, you are saying all these things in sitting in Jakarta, but here um, there is no power. Mm -hmm. There is no, uh, you are talking about 24 hours by seven connectivity, but if there is no power, um, you know, people are, uh, so we have to look, you have to develop some offline content, something that they can be downloaded, uh, downloadable rather than be accessible in real time. Or they can have a case study. For instance, you have a case study in a business. Mm -hmm. If you are talking about uh, just the big companies in Jakarta mm -hmm. or in um, Bangkok or some places, it may not make much sense to um, uh, for a person in the village, mm -hmm. right? So yesterday in the, my guest house, the attendant, he, I asked him, as I mean, we are teachers, right? We always engage in asking young people what they would like to do. And then he said that actually he is from a very rural area in Borneo, uh, and he wants to set up a, um, a, a shop, a business, where he wants to uh, supply chicken feed. Mm -hmm. And he said, sir, wh what can I do? <laughs> and so I ended up giving him a one hour lecture on what he can do, right? So I mean, what, I don't know anything about his condition, but the, the template I was, I was putting into place is, um, is universal that you need to know who our customer is, what is your competition, how many chicken feet there are, what are the existing uh, people businesses and how he can actually increase his base by having other young people start a poultry farm. So if you start your say that okay poultry farm the more businesses more hens chicken there will be the more there will be demand for his, this thing and along with that chicken feed he should supply fertilizers and so on. What I was doing that, I don't know, and do not know anything about uh, chicken uh, supply. Obviously, I would be better off doing that. But the mantra is, think global, act local. Still is. So you have, you should have an overall plan of what the, your strategy is. But how does it apply to my particular, your particular uh, uh, region is very, um, very important. Um, what the gentleman is alluding was my yesterday's talk on this, uh, on digital um, trends. And I said that this is, there is, it is promoting uh, a trend towards what you call e-haves and e-have-nots. So people who are digitally very competent, they are succeeding, they are being, pro they are prospering. But other, other people who are not, the poor people, the people in villages, the illiterate and the, who do not have access to technology, they are falling behind. So this is technology instead of flattening our social structure is in fact 
promoting, may be promoting, end up promoting more iniquity and also uh, in the, the, the gap between the people who make use of technology to be to earn and people who are who are falling behind is growing larger. This bridge has to be, this divide has to be bridged. Unless you do that, there will be social tension. There cannot be a, you cannot be rich by making everyone else poor, right? There will be a lot of social tension. Um, yesterday, um, some of you may have been there in my lecture and I shared a personal anecdote which always sticks with me about these challenges of um, making people, average persons, um, um, digitally competent. And I would like to share it for the benefit of those who are not. Um, I, was a, I was in charge, a director of communication in India. And one of the telephone exchanges in the early 90s was going to be completely paperless, right? So completely technology oriented. And a very senior officer, a secretary to the government of India, was supposed to come and inaugurate that. So it was a very big responsibility on my shoulders. I made sure that all the data was entered, everyone is, um, um, you know, it was ready to go. But a few days before the inauguration, I went um, and visited this office. And the supervisor there um, was a very elderly man. He just had six months before retirement. And he came after me saying that, sir, I want to go and leave. I said, are you crazy? I mean, this is... It's impossible. I cannot give you what is the what is the problem. And he said, No, I just I'm not feeling well. Mm. I said, Do you feel you are, you don't look that unwell, hospitalized. You can wait for three days. I'll you can then after that you can take as much leave as you you want. He was insistent. He did not. Uh, he was very very upset. So I asked one of the younger staff whom we had actually recruited and put up this thing. I said, uh, What's the problem? Why is he he should be looking forward to this? event is uh, after me and she said sir actually to be honestly he's very scared mm. because he is so afraid that he might do something he might commit a blunder that um, you know the whole system inauguration will be failure and he'll be his retirement pension may be with you know the usual anxieties I said why should you be afraid you people are there you are younger people and you are your engineers and she said sir I have told them that not to do anything in fact we will also press the button for him but he would not listen because he's so afraid so that night I went back and thought about it I said on the one way I can actually put up a window dressing it you know just like okay the VIP will come everything will be fine and I'll release it and we'll move on right but most of my employees were like that supervisor. Most of them are elderly and uh, not very tech savvy. So I can make up a um, show or I can actually have a genuine um, uh, demonstration that computerization is possible in this office. So I went back to my boss and I told him that, uh, sir, uh, there is a problem because we have, we, we may not be ready. Uh, because of some, I, I lied actually, I said that data entry is not complete. And he was furious. Fortunately for me, that event, the function was delayed and the secretary did not come. He had to, and we, have, we made a, another, uh, that event was held later, two months later. So I went up to this uh, supervisor and I said, I will not inaugurate this office unless you can do these three tasks. And first is you can um, change the password, take a backup, and create a new user. That is a simple, basic thing. He said, sir, I do not think, but anyway, I, I said, no, now we have enough time. There is no inauguration. We will not this thing, but you have to do this. Anyway, this function was held at the local uh, after two, three months with the local offices, nothing very big. But in the meeting, this gentleman goes up to this thing and he says, um, he started crying, he started actually weeping. And um, I didn't know why he was uh, crying, but he's, he was talking in local tongue, which is, uh, I could understand. And he was in local language, he was saying that I started my career 35, 40 years ago as a sweeper in this, it used to be a post office come a telephone exchange. I was a sweeper in this place, right? And so my only job, my dream was to get a permanent job, but by a hard work. And he was a very good, sincere employee. So he, in this thing, he got a regular employee and he says, not only become, become regular, I'm now retiring as a supervisor. And not only that, I am retiring as a computer supervisor, <laughs> whatever he meant, right? So but tears came to my eyes because I said that if this person can be, can learn to use technology, then there is no excuse 
for anyone else to say that, sir, I cannot do this. Right? So, uh, overcoming the psychological barrier, mm -hmm. telling people, ensure, assuring them they, they can do it. And this is not something for a gimmick, but also to increase the customer satisfaction for the development, for their own good and for the country's good, is once they understand that, then they really put in the best effort at every level. Different people have different capabilities, but that, that is how leadership is generated. So the person who is uh, that supervisor who uh, was able to do these three things, he became a leader among the other people because he said, okay, this person took so much effort to learn this. So we should be able to also do something. So uh, the question about leadership, this is, is empo empowerment and engagement are the two crucial elements of leadership, which I believe um, has to be concomitant and has to be simultaneously and in sync with any digital technology that we may implement. The second question yeah. about uh, the, mobile, the mobility of the workforce is like very fast in the digital era. Basically. Yes, and, and, and as we've seen the digital um, winners case, we, they, the, the workers move not just, not just because they want to move, mm. right? It is, it, is, it is not human. What they're looking for is that they find that this is not a place for growth that even their best ideas are not accepted. Nobody really listens to them. And then they feel a sense of disenfranchisement. This is, that is why people um, sometimes, you know, they, they move on. Uh, it traditionally, even not just a mobile, the current workforce, as we know that the number one reason why people quit jobs are, are supervisors. You may, nobody has joined an organization to quit. They all, we look at, oh, this is a very good organization, there's very big buildings, there's very good benefits. But after some time, and this is, that was a job which we all wanted to really be part of. We took so much effort to prepare for interview, start exam. And then after being selected, we said, hi, hey, this, um, this is not what, it's, uh, what this thing, there's nobody, this is just a fake organization. This is a lot of dictators. And um, you, also, you hate the, the way you are being treated, insulted, uh, discouraged. And that gives you an incentive to, to quit. So um, in, in terms of the mobility, I think we need to, as, as leaders, we need to generate, make the workplace more interesting and engaging. It is not enough to pay people a salary. People are not machines. They have emotions. They have their own personal stories to tell. Every single person, from the person who is a security guard to the director, dean of this building. Everyone, every person has their own talents. Nobody's a fool. You talk to the person, the sweeper, he also has a family. He is also educated his children. He also has rent a property. He has also taken care of his retirement benefits as, as much as you have. So they are, but the fact is that if you ask for his opinion, he or she will not give you an opinion because he's scared or he thinks that, okay, my opinion, I'm just a sweeper. Who will listen to me? But if you say, no, you are part of my organization, we, ha we are having a different role. Just because I'm sitting behind a table, I'm not a superior human being than you are. If you do your sweeping as perfectly, if I can do this, uh, my job as perfectly as you sweep the floor, then I will consider myself to be thankful. This is something which is, which, which, which is the, so it's a change of organizational culture, uh, not no bossism, no arrogance, and no thinking that I am the one who, is, who has all the wisdom and you are only taking orders. That will never, that kind of organizational climate will never make digitalization successful, regardless of whatever latest gadgetry you may have. So it's, it's important that, uh, that we recognize this and we recognize it at every level. Okay. okay, thank you. And then, Mr. Joko, do you have questions? Pardon? I, can you say it again? No? I, I think he needs some microphone. Thank you. My name is Jokor Harja. <laughs> 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 
my name is Joko Rarjo and I want I want to ask you about uh, aspect of the As an organization, uh, of course, doesn't want to be left behind in this digital era and uh, want to be to get the benefit of the digital era. Uh, but uh, actually, the but there is a readiness between users and the employees is not in balance. Uh, how do we? So do with this kind of uh, problem and uh, what should be determined of this this uh, employees and uh, users readiness okay thank you that's a, that's a, um, that's a big big piece of um, the puzzle because one can buy the latest computers and the most technology, and then that is a you know you replace the hardware. But how do you replace the hardware inside a human being? If there is no uh, you know memory disk that you can upgrade, so it has to be a continuous and gradual process. First of all, is the fear. Uh, we, I just mentioned to you about how people are very wary of using technology. Um, one major thing which I believe has evolutionized in the past few years is the advent of phones. Because people are now able to use a lot of apps, uh, whether to, like WhatsApp has become very popular, especially in Asia. <coughs> and even the people who are like, like in the, um, in, in various manual labors, they are now able to use the smartphone with a fair amount of, um, I would say, ability and dexterity. Now, having exam like in the in in the in the specifically coming to the academic scenario, um, teaching technology, just installing software is not enough. So you have to, I think, continuous amount of treatment, uh, not only training and hands-on tutorials so you have to when our many of the tutorials when uh, the IT department builds up they assume that people know a lot of things about computers already which is not true right so there are be you, you they make may make they, they should make very elementary um, computer software which people can can be hand holding in the passage so that they, 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 even a person who is, does not have any familiarity will be able to have gain some competence. <laughs> I remember in the early days of computerization, uh, and this is something which I have lived through, so I can I relate to what you are saying. Um, we used to teach uh, these uh, Microsoft Office, right? So say that Word and Excel sheets and so on. Those are very elementary level, but um, my. Uh, one my boss, he came around, he's an elderly person, and he said that, he came down and says, look, uh, you open the computer, the trainings, right? So they had the computers. He said, and whatever, we had a backdrop of a tiger and the screen. So uh, everybody had a tiger in their screen, right? It was networked. He says, but when you go back to your own computers, this tiger will not be there. <laughs> so I laughed. I said, what is he talking about? Then one person said, ha, ah, sir, there is no tiger with it. So what, I mean, the point is that people sometimes take training, but you say, okay, you have the plug is on this side. When they go to their own computer, the plug may be on the right side, oh. right? So um, how do you put your USB? How do this thing? So this, then they become very uh, nervous. They said, okay, there is, a, there is some slot here, but should I, if I put it here instead of that, the trainer told me to put it on the left side. And now this is the right. If I do this, then what will happen? <laughs> so this, what we consider to be very basic, very uh, ABCD level, 
actually is important because different people are at different stages of their growth. Thing. Assuming that everybody know, okay, you uh, you can when you log onto the computer, you should change the DNS number to the IP protocol. <laughs> that it goes over the lot of people's head. And if you see, have seen in computer training program, which I have been uh, part of a long time. Many people after lunch hours are sleeping. They are just, they, they know once they go back to the office, they will tell the secretary to take care of it, the, especially the officers. Because they say, this is not for us. This is something they are saying, some language which I cannot understand. And um, so this, this entire thing is to make a hands-on digital um, computer. Uh, this thing is much more, it has to be more hands-on experience. And thanks to it, these days, of course, the training has become much more simpler, primarily because of apps. Mm -hmm. Apps do not let you, let's say you, you, if you want to learn Excel, then you have to learn all the, you know, the various functions of it, mm -hmm. of it. But when you are actually uh, calling, um, you know, using Uber, mm -hmm. you are not using any so uh, detailed software instruction. What you're doing is you're just pressing that, and then whatever that you call the car comes. Or you are making on, online the shopping, you just have to click on the uh, clothes or the shoe and you can order it. So these, um, because a lot of these data are now shifted to the cloud environment and not to your local memory base, so there is nothing you can lose. There is no, uh, if your computer crashes right now, in the Google Chromebook or something, nothing is lost because every, everything is in uh, that um, you know Google um, uh, that uh, Docs or in a Dropbox or something. So you have no fear of the local uh, machine being any any destroyed, damaged by your by your activities. Um, depending uh, in 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 our uh, some some organizations have started early, some have uh, trying to catch up, but. Uh, I, I would say it again and again that you, it is not possible to recruit only top level talent from the market because we cannot afford it. The most top people will either go abroad or work somewhere, big private companies will take it. In the government organizations like, uh, like yours and ours, we have to make use of our existing human resources who are good people. They were selected because they are good. You did not select them. Uh, in fact, the previous traditionally the government service was a very a very uh, attractive employment. So some of the best students used to go to government. Suddenly, after five years in government, many people become unemployable <laughs> because they have not not because they have become uh, more stupid, but because they were not uh, you know empowered. Mm -hmm. They were not given authority to do anything of their own. There was no accountability. We all work as a, as a group. So if you, if you tell that, if you now is the time to have individual um, employee and tell them that this is okay, this is your job. You, you, if, you, if you are in inventory management, you should ma maintain this record or do some tasks that he or she is accountable to. And then if he or she succeeds, it will take, he'll, he or she will make mistakes. But it is your job as a, as a leader to help him and you know, hold his, his or her hands. So it's a long process. I, I will t t totally not say that it's an easy process that just because you have bought these fancy computers, everything is becoming digitalized. If that was so easy, then we will not be having this conversation today. Mm -hmm. When I was doing my research in the 90s, I, wrote a, I read a book uh, called In the Age of Smart Machines mm -hmm. uh, by Susanna Zuboff, and she was uh, a Harvard um, sociologist. And so she wrote a book in 1974 about exact problems that we are discussing in 2018. Because technology is not, has not remained the same, right? So every time you feel that all those people who, who became computer experts with the mainframe computers in the 70s yeah. did not have a job in the 80s. All those people who, who had learned, let's say, um, uh, all those um, language C++ or even SAP, etc., are irrelevant now. Now the thing has become much more in a different. The Fortran became, and COBOL became obsolete, and then new languages came in. So technology is not a one-shot one affair. It's not like learning a language. Once you have learned English, you learn all the things. It's not that. You, it has to be a continuous process at each step, and there's still to a lot of hand-holding. Uh, but the benefits are tremendous. The benefits are tremendous because overall it's, it's not just you, your workplace becomes more interesting 
but also your stakeholders, who are, you should always see that why you are here for. As academics, my, I, I get a salary for the students, not to please everybody else. If I'm, if I'm in the good books or dean and president, that's fine. But my primary and only responsibility is to the students. Same thing in government service. If you are there, then you are, you are who is you? If you're in railways department or your postal department, telecom, then you are, your job is not just to earn a salary. You are there for a purpose. So in order to make the, my students happy, in order my, to ensure that my students get the best benefit for the amount of money, and more importantly, time. Because the time is the most important. The four years they're spending with me, or three or 18 months they're spending with me. They should go back. This time is not go going to come back from them. Anybody who's done an MBA is not going to do another MBA. Very rarely they do. But if they're doing this 18 months MBA, then they should be able to go you know, as toe to toe or at equal terms with any students from any other university. Mm -hmm. You cannot say, okay, I'm a, uh, this, I'm a limited, I'm open university, that university, no. My, I want this thing, all students are created equal. Let's assume that. We can, just because they're an open university doesn't make them any, any less or more than others. But if they have, our job as faculty is to give them ample opportunities and so that they are able to make use of, let's say in business, we ask them to go and uh, do a simulated social media. So we have a sandbox, a Twitter and a Facebook, which is not released this thing. So they should be able to type messages within 140 characters so that they can promote their brand in the public space. Because Twitter is now the most, uh, you know, most potent form of advertisement. If they are able to um, do understand analytics, Watson analytics or um, uh, maybe you know access online databases like hoovers or munch and online then they will be much more they will see that you know five years down the line say okay that education I, I received at ut really helped me become a better managers and not just a degree not just a degree to hang their show on, on the wall nobody cares about that really after once in a job you know, this thing so uh, it, it's a long process but it's entirely worth it i would think Right. Um, I'm familiar with that, um, sir, because I was in the government service and many people mentally retire years before they actually retire physically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they are retirement and some people are, even the last day of the retirement, they are constantly wanting to learn some new things, do creative. So it depends on the personality. It's, um, it's a state of mind, I would think. Um, but as I, as I mentioned in my, in my in my talk that this is a unique time in, in workspace because we have so many different generations with different experience and perspectives. So uh, there are people who, are, who, did, who did not actually have uh, or ever, ever dream about that these things will take place um, uh, in the lifetime, and, but they are also there and then the younger generation. So to, to, to answer your question about um, about how to make them more digitally um, uh, yeah, literate about it is, is first of all, uh, not to demean their experience, which is which many times we tend to, organizations tend to do. They say, oh, you have become obsolete. You are, uh, you are uh, younger people are, are so, you know, look how fast it is and you know, you are not this thing. That is knowledge uh, changes, but wisdom does not. As we become older, all of us, we, we, we are, do not necessarily become more, have more information, but our experience over teaching over a period of time has make us more sensitive to students' demand and to, to students' requirements. So that is something which only age and experience can bring about. So there has to be a happy marriage between our experience and the tools that we have. So digital technology is just a tool. How we use it definitely depends on our, our ability and our enthusiasm and our commitment. Uh, it is not a rocket science. It's not something, something that it's not, um, 
that is uh, that cannot be done there is definitely a argument to be made that some people do not want to do it and they want to be because they it's extra work for sure i mean as i mentioned um, this certification program that i took was a lot of work and some people were frankly curious as to why uh, i was doing it because i i really do not have any teaching um, uh, load as administrator myself but i always like to teach because without teaching you do not get to know your students and you cannot have develop policy unless you are you know your stakeholders right so my appeal to those people is that it would be I, I, the way i view it at it's it's actually selfish and i would say unpatriotic to stop learning new things so long as we are earning a salary if we are in the job then we should be in tune with what the organizational commitment is i can no longer say okay i am old so i don't know how to do this then uh, i think the the best thing is to is to quit the job and which i in my personal case when i found that government was not the right fit for me and academics suited me i resigned even though i had i waited for one and a half years to pick up a pension or something because i i thought that personal that's my personal view that it dishonest uh, to not to not to uh, evolve and mature and progress and to be in sync with the organization uh, goals um, even while being a member of the organization because i'm sure that somebody else would be glad to do the work that i'm i'm particularly doing so uh, i think there so there is a two two way answer to that the younger generation has to be more tolerant more patient and explain to the older generation that their their uh, experience counts their wisdom counts and their input is crucial to the way that we de develop this um, you know the digital policy and concurrently i think the older guards also have responsibility to be in tune and in step with the digital requirements of the organization so okay okay uh, sure. sorry yeah okay thank you uh, prof sandeep uh, any questions from upbjj hello Uji Pangkal Pinang, ada pertanyaan? Siapa? Oh, Bandung, silakan. Silakan, Pak. Can we hear that? Mike, mic-nya tolong dipencet, Pak. Mike. kurang dekat ya yeah, silakan what mistakes mistakes oh the one with the problems implementing Please diulang. Yeah. Well, um, not implementing all the things that I mentioned <laughs> <laughs> is is to is definitely um, will be a mistake. Um, but not having a to 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 to, 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 to large question is not thinking through the strategy not really having a overall strategy that how our organization is going to be in this area in in the long term perspective that um, in 5 years time in 10 years time um, what is uh, are we are, are we prepared to with a blueprint to to deal with them to make the necessary budgetary alloc allocations to our recruitment will have to be in advance uh, for everything that we'll be doing in the future so in the university context which we are all members of one thing to look at is what kind of job skills that the the market is looking for and not what we are have the capability to teach many times professors we teach what we is our research area what we have our strong strength 
that may or may not be very valid in the marketplace. And so to have a comprehensive view, it is best to go to have a survey to maybe look at the job sites. Um, recently, we did a massive um, assessment of what kind of job requirements uh, are being advertised in the, um, in the job portals, right? There's an indeed.com. And so we, we surveyed <clears throat> almost close to 3,000 jobs in marketing. And we said, what are the common requirements that these companies are looking for? So after identifying those attributes, we decided to incorporate them in the syllabus so that we, to guarantee that we are covering those um, topics in our courses and so that the students, when they get a degree, will be ready if they are in, in, in the asked in an interview if they knew these, uh, you know, these Bakerman analysis or whatever those qualities that company is looking for, they should be able to say yes and not no, this was not covered in our courses. So mistakes uh, can be many, but um, the, the ma ma main idea is that we should not be afraid of mistakes um, while implementing strategies. I mentioned that there will be, it's, a, it's always a learning process. Not everything can be implemented the same way in one university and, and, and other, in one, one organization or other. Different, different organizations have different demands. They have different, uh, you know, the, 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 the makeup is different. So um, getting, to get, getting together a strategy is the number one. Working consistently would be the follow-up on that. And I would argue that the third more, most important constant is to constantly have a review, a feedback loop from the end users with the implementing strategies. So if somebody will, will have to reassess this um, project, just because we have spent a large amount of money does not mean that we should not ask question as to whether this project is going well or not. Sometimes we have, don't ask questions. We've already spent $5 million. This is not the time to ask question. Yes, it is the time to ask questions because if you don't ask the tough questions, then the next $5 million will be wasted. So if this is not working, this strategy is not working well, then we should cut our losses and start thinking of something else. So um, implementing, having a macro view, having a uh, kind of holistic design um, so that this can be a forward thinking, a proactive organization, getting the right people. At the end of the day, it is not machines. Machines can be easily purchased. Much more difficult is to have the right fit for right people and to ha have a continual feedback, not uh, from both, from all stakeholders, both from our end users, in our case a student, as well as our own internal stakeholders like the faculty and the administrative staff and the support specialists, those feedback also have to be implemented and see that how best we can tweak, how best we can modify these digital uh, initiatives in order to best suit our purpose. I hope that answers your question, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Was Bapak. Uh, there is from Sorom. Anybody want to raise question from Sorong or Pangal Pinang? Pangal Pinang, ada pertanyaan? Pardon me? Oh yeah, please. Uh, several islands, yeah. how to manage that? This is actually, the digital world has actually a great boon for uh, an islands, because just imagine the physical, um, the, the traditional modes of communication between, let's say, letter mail, which would be dependent on nature, on the, on the geographical challenges. So especially this, Digital initiatives are excellent for, for um, distributed islands, as, as you mentioned. And in fact, um, online 
activities were the most prominent, let's say, in countries like Australia, just because it was so far apart. So they were actually the pioneers in introducing VSATs in the early 70s, um, where they could use satellites to, to have dist distance educations. So um, your uh, uh, geographical position makes it extremely important that you have the latest digital um, infrastructure. Um, that way you are able to access a much larger body of knowledge and information than you would have been otherwise been um, it would have been, it would have been uh, possible. However, it is also important that uh, our your education that you are giving is also in has relevance for the people who are living there. Um, if your students happen to be from that area, then their conditions, their geographical position has to be accounted for. So you, I, my suggestion is to build up courses or even case studies which are relevant, uh, uh, give examples in the class which are relevant to, to the people around in that place, what we in marketing called as, you know, in a particular segment. So addressing the needs of segment and also applying the principles which are applicable in, to the to the non-island and to the mainland population uh, is important, but uh, this is this is something. Is, um, you know, digitalization is important, but it is extremely important, especially for distributed networks, distributed places of work, as you have mentioned. So, I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, any anybody want to raise question from here? If oh, Pak Firman, please. Please, uh, you can stop in Indonesian. You can. Yeah. Press, yeah. <laughs> please. Uh, Okay, please, do you understand? Uh, the first question about uh, the curriculum uh, related to the, pro we have two programs, okay. two programs, there's uh, management and the business administration, mm -hmm. and then the content of the curriculum is uh, quite similar, mm -hmm. and how to, how to uh, marketing the, the program for you? Uh, which one the suitable program for each students, maybe, or the prospect students? That's the first one. Um, that is that is okay. Let me let me approach it from from a marketing point of view. Every uh, product, and I would I'm taking as a the, the program as a product should have a USP that is called a unique selling proposition, right? So, we you um, definitely um, I agree with you that management and um, the other co program business administration, business administration business. Business, they will have overlap, right? Yeah. They will have overlap because after all, you are managing business in one, and managing organizations in one. And as we, as my talk yesterday also was, um, I, I, even today, that many of the principles remain the same for both, both both managing organizations and non-business, uh, whether talking, working for a for-profit or non-profit. Some of the principles happen to be the similar. That said, you should each program should have some unique content to offer. Um, my suggestion would be, let's say, in management, in, in one of the program, you should have uh, the business program should have more business focus, as, as I'm sure it has. But um, how about introducing some um, simulations, where you can somebody in the finance um, uh, course can actually be given some 
um, you know, digital currency mm -hmm. so that they can invest in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And so they can groups and so they can at the end of all the time they're monitoring their um, returns. In fact, in some of the schools, like in um, American schools, they actually have real money. Mm -hmm. They are given some uh, corpus of money where the financial students can actually invest in real world stock market. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, because it's a small amount of investment, so they don't lose much, they don't gain much, but the students get an experience in working for that. So, so if somebody really wants to set up a business, uh, then obviously that kind of will be attractive for to go in for business management side than the organizational point kind of way. However, if somebody wants to know the leadership skills, they are already in their jobs. They don't. Have, they are not looking for a shift in careers. They're already in the, uh, let's say, in the in the public sector. They're academicians, or they are working in some uh, retail store, or something in in a HR. So they want to you know the skills of the organizational this thing. So for them, you really need to have uh, more emphasis and more hands-on simulations on team building on many of the soft skills which are we really do not teach in a business curriculum because our time is short. We cannot uh, just think, so like public speaking. Let's say, you say uh, we in fact had a course thing that one person is supposed to come up and tell a joke which everybody, you know, which can be, everybody can enjoy. You'll find how difficult it is to come up with a joke that to make anyone laugh, <laughs> right? So these skills, but those skills, humor is a very important skill for a leader. A, a person who, a leader who does not, you know, make a joke is does not, not very popular. <laughs> so we, we try to, those soft skills, those management, general management skills can be emphasized. But essentially, whether you are talking about business management or the general management, it has to be interesting. And when I say interesting, the, the, it, has to be, um, it has to be interesting for the uh, faculty to teach it, because if the faculty does not find it interesting, then his or her boredom also get trans, trans communicated to the students, right? And it has to be refreshed. What you did it in uh, three years back cannot, is not relevant for today's time. Not that, some of, most of it, many of the classic studies are there, but it has to be updated all the time. So, um, that prevents also people from cheating, from plagiarism. They cannot copy from some other, uh, somebody's answer. So those two are um, refreshing content and making a unique a positioning of your other program is extremely important. Do you, uh, the, no, the, uh, yeah. the other, uh, second part Where is like, For DeFabo or uh, like DeFabo students? Oh yeah, that, that is a big I challenge. Uh, there is no, uh, they, we have very strict, uh, the um, American Disability Act, for instance, is a very strong, of uh, giving accommodations and a uh, lot of these things. So the extra time should be given to student to complete and or any video should have a transcript. Okay. It cannot be a YouTube video which does not have a transcription. Uh, there should be a, a um, uh, you know, uh, many people suffer from dyslexia which is, um, they find it difficult to process uh, this thing. So you can have as much visual content as possible, not just text based. So uh, there is, there, we, have to, we, uh, we have to recognize that different people have different abilities. They are not, we may call them disabled, but they may be very extremely good visual learners. Mm -hmm. They may process things differently than we do, but that does not make, make them less, lesser students than they are, they are. So this is the ongoing uh, thing because basically a lot of things in the digital era are dependent on sight. So somebody who is not, who, is, who does not have, who is blind, obviously, would lo losing out. So we'll try to see that whether the, some of the topics can also have a, an audio part of it and uh, distributing lectures so that their lectures are not just in script but also in audio. So yes, that's a very genuine thing and I appreciate your bringing it up. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I, will, I, I have one question, but uh, maybe later on I will ask it yeah, sure. because it is already twelve o'clock. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry for you. Yeah. <laughs> so we should end up this uh, discussion, and then uh, I would like to say thank you so much for M Professor Sandeep, and also to all participants here and at regional centers. Uh, I hope I hope that the knowledge and information that we shared today would uh, useful for all of us. Okay, thank you. Thank Assalamualaikum you. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good day.
maybe pictures time or <laughs> please prof dariana yeah. okay